Hi, come on in. My name is Rick Boots. Welcome to Wood Carving. Today we're going to be making this early American eagle design that's based on a pattern from the War of 1812. And that's where the slogan, Free Trade and Sailors' Rights, was from. The interesting thing about this is an example of a relief carving. Where we're working on various levels. And when you're doing this carving, you kind of need to give that some thought. What's going to be the high spots? What's going to be low? And you kind of need to mentally plan that as you're working. What I was doing when you came in, I was just taking a few minutes and roughing away some of the excess wood along the wings. Now, what I did for my pattern here was I used a copy machine and enlarged the pattern in the book to the size that fit uh, what I wanted. And that's the great thing about these copy machines that have different sizes and it saves a lot of time wasted trying to second guess uh, your sketch size. So anyway, you make it to the size you want, trace it on the wood, and then cut it out with a band saw or a coping saw, and then you're ready to tear into it. This wood eagle has a fair amount of wood that needs to be removed. I'm using a number seven gouge to rough this out. It's a fairly wide one, 35 millimeter number seven. And it's got a fair amount of cutting edge. And the, the extra curve here helps you to scoop out that wood, which makes it great for roughing out because it removes a fair amount of wood fairly quickly, especially when you're using the mallet to tap it through the wood. And when you get the wood kind of roughed out to where you want, one thing that helps is to take a V gouge and use that to outline the areas. And by that I mean you make an incisor cut around the different areas that are going to be high or low, and it helps you with your planning of the carving. For example, we can work right around the shield here, because we know that's going to be raised up. And this step is called outlining. And see, so we're going to come around his uh, leg here. It's best not to go too deep with this. If the tool starts to dig in, you're better off just kind of stopping and then making a couple of cuts to bring it down to the depth. When you're outlining, if you go too deep or try to get greedy with one cut, there's always a chance of breaking the tool. So we want to keep it, oh, maybe about uh, an eighth of an inch, certainly no more than a quarter of an inch at a time when you're roughing out. around the talons here. And what this does is it helps establish in our minds what's going to be raised and what's going to be lowered in the carving.
Now, we can go back to uh, roughing this out some more. The early American Eagles make great designs to carve because there's so much variety in them. Just about every woodcarver in the late 17 and early 1800s had their own idea on how the eagle should look. The other day I had a chance to look at some really neat examples of the early American eagle carvings. Let's go take a look. We're here at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts to look at some of the small carved eagles in their collection. This one here is especially interesting. It was a figurehead on a small sailing vessel like a schooner. And what I like about it is how the carver used deep relief carving techniques to create the effect. For example, the beak and the eyes, the details are carved fairly deeply in. And it's done in a sort of realistic style. The feathers along the neck, and as you work farther back, you can tell it's been done with a, uh, looks like about an 18 millimeter number five gouge. And then the background has been carved away deeply so they are modeled in a fairly high relief. On the other hand, we have a, an example by our old friend John Bellamy, and you can see how he's used a different interpretation for carving the beak and the face. It's almost impressionistic. The feathers along the neck, they aren't even detailed. He just used a gouge and kind of walked along the back to create the effect of the texture. The wings, he used a number five gouge, about 30 millimeters wide, to set in the cuts and then pare away the background in a very shallow cut, sort of giving it a nice shallow relief impressionistic effect. This is a nice example of a smaller figurehead that was designed to save weight. It was carved by Isaac Fowles in the mid 1800s and it's really kind of a nice carving effect. You notice how he used a V-gouge to texture the hair to get a nice long flowing look. And then he used another gouge to make sort of tiny imprints in the armor and in the belt well, that's just a nice, straightforward relief carving project. This is really a nice carving. This painting shows the clipper ship, the Southern Cross, as it appeared in 1851. Like all clippers, it had clean lines and could carry a lot of sail. Notice the only carving is an eagle figurehead and a simple trailboard leading back from the bow. There was no heavy weight to slow this ship down. Here's another example by John Bellamy. In this piece, He's used the same style of carving for the eagle and then added the cross flags later. These are carved in a very realistic manner. The wood is almost two inches thick and the folds actually look like cloth. The banner is a flat piece of wood, probably pine, with painted lettering. This was added on later. When you're roughing this out, you want to bring it down to a thickness of oh, about a quarter of an inch at the bottom edge of the wing here. Yeah, that looks pretty close to about where we want it. We'll uh, take a minute and uh, round off the top of the head here too while we're at it. These lines, as you carve them away, that's a real simple matter just to go ahead and redraw those in. Now to get to the other wing, the easiest thing to do would be to just to take and turn this right around. And that's why with this, I used the hardwood holding block again, just screwed it into the back. And then I can fit it into the vise and really turn it just about any direction you want. Now 
I'll just do the same thing with this wing here. Sometimes I have people ask me and they say, wouldn't a machine be faster? Couldn't I do this with some kind of a, a power tool like a router or something? And yeah, you could, I suppose. But the thing you have to remember is that these carving tools have been designed after centuries of use. And they've had like five or six hundred years of empirical testing. And that's the only tool that they had to do this type of work with. So they have designed the tools as efficiently as they can get them. And you can really, really remove a fair amount of wood quite quickly with this. Faster than with any machine that I uh, have in my workshop. I was reading the other day that the old figurehead carvers, when they're making one of those ship's figureheads that might be, oh, eight or nine feet tall or even uh, bigger so they'd be seen from a distance, they figured that they allowed one day of carving time per foot of height for the figure and then a day for painting. Which, when you think about the amount of wood that was being removed, is fantastic. And they're all doing it with tools like this. This is really kind of fun. You just kind of just relax and uh, tear away that wood. It's a, a nice change of pace from all the detailing that we sometimes do. And certainly it's a nice change of pace from all the detailing of the feathers that we're going to be doing later. So this is a great chance to kind of work out your frustrations and uh, get ready for the fine work. I think that's uh, getting pretty close there. We're ready to start moving on to the next step. And what we'll be doing is using a smaller gouge to do some of the smoothing out of these rough cuts. And you can use this, do this by using a mallet, or if you only have a little bit, you can also just do it by hand. I was doing some reading about early American eagles, and it's kind of an interesting story behind them. When the founding fathers of the country decided that they wanted to have an emblem to represent the spirit of the United States, there were some different opinions on just what would be the most ideal way to show the mood and the spirit and the, the ideals of the new country. Thomas Jefferson initially proposed a design with the children of Israel being led out of the wilderness. On the reverse side of the seal, he wanted Hengist and Horsa, the Saxon chiefs, being shown. And I don't know what that has to do with the America, but if you've ever read any of the books by Mary Stewart, of uh, the Merlin trilogy, uh, Hengist and Horsa, the Saxon chiefs, were not the good guys. <laughs> they were the nasty Saxons that were uh, making life hard for the English. But somehow the uh, 
early founding fathers were on an interesting uh, mythological kick. Uh, Adams proposed Hercules being led up by virtue, who was going to be portrayed as a beautiful uh, maiden of the 18th century with sloth on the peering on the ground as probably some scuzzy guy, I don't know. <laughs> so you hear stories about how uh, Benjamin Franklin said, oh, we ought to make the, the symbol a, a turkey. It kind of makes sense after some of those ideas. OK, now this is uh, an example of how using a uh, finer tool, like in this case, the number five, kind of smooths out all those rough furrows that were left by the uh, number seven we used initially. One of the things I wanted to just mention here is a little bit on how to sharpen these tools. I notice this one's starting to get just a little bit dull. And let me take a minute and just put an edge on that. There's a couple of things that we can do to speed up our sharpening. And the thing that uh, a lot of people get confused about is everybody they talk to about sharpening will tell them something different. We talked a little bit about knives earlier. And we can use the same technique for sharpening our gouges. I'll put the India stone here and put a few drops of oil on it. And then to sharpen it, we take our gouge and just slide it back and forth on the stone in a rocking motion. Now, the thing you need to remember on this is the angle that you hold it to the stone will be the same angle that the tool is going to start cutting the wood at. So you want to hold it about a 25 degree angle. If you hold it real high, then that's the angle that it's going to be cutting the wood at, which is really too high to work efficiently. About 25, maybe 30 degrees. Any place in there is fine. It's hard to measure, so just kind of give it your best guess. You work that on the stone until you can feel a burr edge. And that's a little edge of metal that builds up from the sharpening process. You check for it by running your finger away from the cutting edge. And eventually, you feel a little burr, kind of like what we feel right here. It's almost invisible. When you can feel that, you're done with the stone. That's as sharp as the stone's going to make your tool. But we're only about halfway there. To take the burr off, we can hone it with a slip stone. You can either use a hard white Arkansas stone or a black Arkansas stone. They're getting harder to find these days because they're kind of running out of the rock. <clears throat> you can use also a ceramic slip stone. And this is a, a new material that very closely approximates the finest of the white and black Arkansas stones. And to take the burr off, you just hold it at a 45 degree angle to this edge of the, or to the shaft of the blade here, and pull it towards you with a very light cutting motion, just a very feather motion there. And that will remove much of that burr. We can flip it over, do the same thing on the back side. And I usually make about, oh, half a dozen passes on either side. And that will remove, oh, most of the burr edge. Then for the final polishing, you can take a strop. And that's a piece of leather um, that's glued or tacked down to a, a board. This is, particular one is one that I designed that has a curved surface on it, which is great for doing the gouges. And you just take and rub a little fine abrasive in there. And then just take and stroke the gouge along there. And that'll polish that edge to a perfect razor sharpness. And that's what you really need for carving, especially in this wood that we're using, like a uh, soft pine or a basswood, which we have today. Do a few passes on the inside, a few passes on the other side, and then check it for sharpness. And then we're ready to go again.
Sharpening is the real secret of wood carving. It's about 80% of the carving. To check for sharpness, all you have to do is just make a cut across the grain of the wood. So it makes a nice clean cut, a nice curl, it makes sort of a whistling sound. The tool is ready to go. And there we have it. For the talon, we'll just kind of round this area off here. Below. And then take the shield down uh, even farther as we go. A place like the thigh, we can just sort of bevel that in there. And just keep working that until you get to the depth that you want. One of the tips I want to show you here is separating the shield and the banner. And what you can do is uh, take your mallet and find a tool. The curvature just about matches the line that you want. And this number th uh, five that I'm using is very close. And then just make a vertical cut down. Then walk that along. OK, now that's a little tight. Let me get another tool here. Let's go to number three. That's what's great about this. You get a chance to have all these tools to use, and you have a great excuse. So whenever someone says, oh, what shall I get you for Christmas? Say, hey, how about a 35 millimeter number three gouge? And I'll say, what? How about a lawnmower? Anyway, make a vertical cut down, and then I'm going to come over from the side here and make a cut in. And that's how we separate the shield. And these little fuzzies that are here, you can just take and, again, retrace your initial cut. And just keep doing that until you get down to the depth that you want. Now, for doing the scroll here, if we want to have it scooped out, we can just take a fairly flat tool, like the number three we have in our hand. It's uh, 35 millimeters wide. And make a series of cuts. What I like to do is make some going down, and then I come around from the other side. And basically, just shape out a rounded notch. Now, because we're dealing with a fairly thick piece of wood here, we can make this quite a curve to the scroll. And that gives it a real nice sort of flowing motion, like it's sort of flapping in the breeze. For the center part, what's happening is when you're going down this way, when you get down to the bottom of the cut, you're starting to go against the grain here, and you can feel it start to dig in. And that's why you can't just go keep like going that way, because you'll just split out that big chunk. So when we go this way and go this way, we're basically working with the grain. But when you get down to the bottom, you always have a little bit of fuzzies there, because it's difficult to get that smooth. No problem. Just grab another gouge with a, uh, a fair amount of sweep to it. Oh, the seven that we had earlier may fit there. And just take, and you can just pair any of the rough edges off by going across that cut. And that's how you clean that out. And around the scroll end, we can just go right down. Next time, when we get together, I'll do the, show you how to do some of the feathering details, and we'll finish up our eagle. I've had a lot of fun being with you today. Until next time, I'm Rick Boots, wishing you happy carving. Rick Boots has written two books entitled Wood Carving Step by Step, 
woodland creatures, and Santas. Rick demonstrates and describes through extensive illustrations and photographs how to carve a chipmunk, a river otter, a red fox, an alpine St. Nicholas, an Adirondack Santa and his bear, and a Swiss St. Nicholas. The true book collection is available by calling 1-800-950-9648. The price is $29.90 plus shipping and handling.